Revolution, this is Brother Leonard, the truth seeker, and I'm coming to you with a few minutes of truth, and let's get right into it, uh, because the video that I'm going to play for you at the end is qu quite lengthy, um, but I just want to say from the door that there is a reason why Bishop Tommy Dester Jakes is the kingpin of all kingpins, the pimps among all pimp preachers, the, you know, whatever, the top dog, the Pope of Popes. He, one thing I can say about him, and from what I can see about covering him, is that he is no dummy when it comes to this church game. While everybody else is looking around playing che checkers, this man actually is playing chess with y'all. But we're going to break it down today. All right. So we've been following this Chris Hill situation since uh, since about, um, I would say, April or so. All right. Since about March, April. And the way that this thing is shaping up is kind of interesting. So let's get to these couple of points first before I get to this before I get to this video. All right, so we all know that on this past Sunday, um, we came to you, at least I came to you with a video on Monday um, talking about the Chris Hill restoration. Okay, let me say this again, because I said this in, the, in, in, in my first video. I'm going to say this in the second video, in this video right here. And I'm probably going to say it again in the next videos that I have to do, because I'm going to have to do a video on pastoral restoration because y'all don't get it and i'm going to say this but y'all don't get it and then i'm going to i'm going to have to do a video on it to break down my position on pastoral restoration i'm going to have to break it down but i'm not prepared to break it down right now uh, because i've been doing new stuff this is new stuff but as a believer yes as according to what is it galatians 6 and 1 um, overtaken with a fall, you know, spiritual restore one another. And never, yeah. As a believer, I believe that Chris, Chris Hill is restored. Cool. You know, I believe he's a believer in Christ. There's just nothing that says that he isn't. However, and however, I just want to make this note. However, there is not a plan for pastors to be restored to being pastors or a plan of restoration for pastoring and there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons behind that there are some ethical reasons and some spiritual reasons that we in some scriptural reasons that i will get into in another video that's another video but for this thing i just want it to be said yes he may be restored as a believer but from pastoring he is still unfit and unqualified for service. I don't care who, who who blesses you or anything like that. You're still unfit and unqualified for service, Chris Hill. Yes, you are. Okay. Now, with that being said, the chess move that was played on Sunday, to me, wow. All right. Because at the time when Chris Hill was sitting up there groveling and they snotting over on Jake's and everything like that. And they all hugging on each other, snotting at each other. Torre Roberts, who is the son-in-law or the husband of Bishop Jake's daughter, Sarah Jake's Roberts. That's a great name, by the way. As you can see, I'm wearing a wrestling t-shirt. All right. <laughs> I'm a wrestling fan. But... You know, Sarah Jakes Roberts, and if anybody, you know, if you're a wrestling fan, you know that that's great. All right. But anyways, let me get back to this. That was a little sidetrack thing. Uh, so what we saw was that her husband was in his church making a very big announcement at that time. I'm going to play for you the video, like I said. It's a long, it's a, it's a long announcement, but I want to make sure that you get the full context of what he was saying. And I'm going to break down some things within that announcement here in a few seconds. But 
what he was basically saying was, was that he's going to be the senior pastor of the Potter's House Church in Denver, as well as remaining as a senior pastor of his church, which is called One LA in Los Angeles. So he's going to be doing the flyby, you know, the flyby night pastoring thing. All right. One of these days, I got to do a video about that. Don't like that at all either. But I'm going to do that. That's another time. That's another video down, down the line. All right. Hopefully, uh, I'll just leave it at that. All right. So in his video announcement, he says something. He starts off where he talks about going to this meeting. See, this is the reason why I was telling you back in March when we read the statement from Potter's House Denver about the pastor resigning that I said that it was a forced resignation that in fact he, Chris Hill was fired. Torre basically doesn't say that he was fired, but in the course of the announcement, you could say, yeah, that meeting didn't go well for Chris Hill at all. <laughs> did not go well for him at all. I'm telling did not go well for him. So I stand by my statement that Chris, that because first of all, if you're, if Bishop Jake's got to get on a plane to do anything now, because he's at that stage where he don't fly as much as, you know, he don't go unless there's something. He don't do much. He just basically stays in Dallas, does the Dallas thing, you know, he comes out from time to time, but it got to be big money. So if he decided to get on his plane to fly up to Denver, and calling for his son-in-law to come to Denver wedding. That meeting wasn't going to go well for Chris. It was not going to go well for Chris at all. So they had the meeting. And, and I believe at that time, even though Torre is going to come up with a whole different scenario about this. I believe at that time, Jake saw the opportunity of giving his daughter and son-in-law, one of his churches. That's where I saw that opportunity. And I believe that he brought Torre to that meeting to basically to get him to the point of taking over Potter's house in Denver. All right. That's the first thing. But yeah, that was a forced resignation on Chris Hill. No doubt about that. Forced resignation. So let's fast forward up. And the, and the forced resignation was, we're going to suspend you for 30 days. Okay. We're going to suspend you for 30 days. And then we're going to fire you. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to sign this. I believe this is what happened. I'm not there. I don't have witness to this yet. But I'm going to believe it's something that went similar to like this. We're going to suspend you for 30 days. Here's the letter. On the letter, it says, I, Chris Hill, I have resigned from Potter's House, Denver. And then from 30 days from that date was the date that he posted on it. You know, it was post dated that he, he signed it. They took his keys, kicked him out at that moment, kicked him out back in February. So all the stuff that was going on in March and all that other stuff about the guest preachers and everything like that. That was all a part of the plan, and they went on with that plan until they decided to say, okay, I think now is the time that we start working in Chris and Sarah, uh, not Chris, but Tori and Sarah into this church, and that's how it's going to be. So, at that moment, just when Chris Hill, like I said before, is snotting and crying, listen to what Jake said. Now, I'm not going to say here, sit here and quote, because I don't have it in front of me. But during that video and during that situation, it was kind of iffy about his thoughts on Chris Hill. It was it was kind of like, OK, does that mean that he's been restored to what, what, what does this actually mean? And I think I got a clear answer now. Jakes said, and 
I'm going to try to quote him as best I can, but I may get some things wrong. You can go back to the video and get the specific quote, but at the same time, you can get uh, the gist of what I'm going with this. He said to Chris, we love you. We forgive you. We're praying for you. We believe that God still isn't done with you, that God is still has a great work for you, that you know that you still will do great things in the kingdom or some, something along those lines. Okay? Now, one thing about it was he didn't say that Chris was in the Potter's house family. Or that Chris will do great things with us. That we have some... So, that he did not say. And there's a reason why he didn't say that. Because, like I said, at the same exact time, Torre is sitting up here giving a long explanation about why he's giving the church, going to have the church in Denver and in the church in L.A. Gangster. And all that to do this... Basically, to hide what I believe the real story is. See, Chris was just nothing but another pawn move. Was just a, he was just like a rook moving, moving that rook to be taken over by the bishop, so that bishop can be taken over by the queen. <laughs> just crazy, just chess moves. Chris was a chess move. The sad part about it, and I'm gonna break down the chess move right now. See. What Sunday was, was a distraction from the fact that Jake doesn't want people to think that there's nepotism going on in his church. So while he's giving his church to his daughter and son-in-law, he's going to play the game of showing that Chris Hill is being restored. And because everybody is all on what's going on with Chris Hill, he's going to play the Chris Hill hand while he's working over the tour, while he's working on the Torre and Sarah, you know, Sarah Roberts, their situation all at the same time. Now we're missing that move, but we're paying attention to the Chris Hill move. Gangsta. Just. Pfft. This art of distraction and manipulation, people, you have to know it and you have to recognize it. We were distracted by Chris Hill. Many of us are still distracted by Chris Hill. Y'all still debating me on whether or not he restored or not. I, that's what you're that's what you're debating. But at the same time, what Bishop Jakes just did was pull off a two for one deal. Not only does he have a senior pastor in his Denver church, but he also brought in a whole nother new congregation that's going to that's going to basically impact the Bishop Jakes empire. So now you have Bishop Jakes over in Dallas, two places in Dallas, you have another place in Denver, and now you have you now now you have a fourth place on the West Coast. And here's the thing about it, too. The Chris Hill situation, what, what that also does for Chris is, listen, go do your thing. But notice, he's not going to have the backing, you know, the financial backing of Jake's in the Jake's empire. But if he can go resurrect himself and say like five years from now, he's sitting up there with uh, four or five thousand members. In whatever city that he's in, and he's doing all this stuff, guess what? He's going to be back into the Potter's House family, back into the Potter's House empire. So really what Jakes did was sit up there and say about Chris Hill to the rest of the world, which is very unique for him too, because typically when people cross Jakes and when people bring things across him, they get blackballed. There are preachers that we know that we don't know of right now because they've been blackballed. And this has been going on for years and we don't even talk about these folk. 
Yeah, Torrey says in the video, in his video, that um, that uh, Bishop Jakes has gone on scandal-free. It's not that Jakes is scandal-free. It's just that Jakes just hasn't had a scandal been exposed. And all these black ball preachers haven't come out, really, to say why they were blackballed. A couple of them could come out today and say why they were blackballed? Man. But see, the problem is, is that you got to come out, when you say it, you got to come out not only with truth and conviction, but with the money and resources to handle the litigation. So that's why folk ain't saying nothing. We kn I know stuff, but I can't really say anything because I'm protecting myself you know, because I don't go against rumors and things. But yeah, there's some scandalous stuff that going on, but you can't really say it's scandal unless you have the facts or whatever to prove behind it. And unless you want to go through the litigation of going through that, then that's why Jake sits at the top. But for Chris, it's very interesting because I think that he still sees a potential in Chris that he can still make some money. And that down the line... In about three or four years, if Chris stays, what you know, does what he does, you know, apparently he can preach. Apparently, people like him. That could translate. New area, new church, more money, more power into the Potter's House Empire. Gangster. And I feel bad for the people. That's uh, sitting in the Dallas church watching that sham go on. It was a sham from the moment that he, from the moment that Jakes took off his jacket and started working the altar stuff. It was a sham since then. Yeah, when you, when, I watched a little bit more of the, of the service that day. You know, was able to get a little bit of video of the service that day. From the moment he took off his jacket... So the end of the Chris Hill situation, when he was working the altar and all this other stuff, it was a sham. And that's what y'all get. That's what y'all get got on. Y'all get got on by the shams. I feel bad for y'all down there in Dallas. But it is what it is. I feel bad for the people out in L.A. who got to sit through all that, all that extra talking from Torre to sit up there to wonder if they're going to lose their pastor or not. That was a sham. The sham of the story of, you know, that he had this, he started getting this heart for these people, uh, of the people in Dal in, in Denver and how they're heartbroken. They need a strong leader and I'm starting to get a burden for them. No, nah. you saw opportunity as well. You saw opportunity to make money. And here's the sad part about it on both ends. The people in Denver, the people in Dallas. Guess what? Guess what? And this is the reason why I hate tithing. You want to know what part of your tithe money is going to go to? And this is I hate the tithing doctrine. I hate tithing. I hate it because all it does is it, it supports foolishness like this. And the foolishness that they're going to support is basically we get to have part-time pastor, you know, two Sundays a month. Yeah, we're going to switch them up, but we're going to have to fly them back and forth. Somebody's going to have to pay for those um, for those flight tickets. And it sure ain't going to be Torre. And it sure ain't going to be Sarah. Okay, and guess what? Pretty soon, y'all gonna have to raise money to buy him a plane. But, y'all, it is what it is. Y'all being played. This is a game. Y'all getting played. All right, well, let's get to this video. Let's get to this video. I didn't mean to go on for 20 minutes, but still, this thing is crazy, and this whole situation is crazy, so I just want to get you this video right now so that you can get up there and be in, and, and know what's going on, that's going on in the churches, and yes, if y'all sit up here and think that y'all are not getting played in church, y'all going to all these conferences, you're mega festing and everything like that, you're getting played. It don't it don't need all this to be a believer in Christ. Don't need all this. But y'all getting played. You want your game, whatever. This is the game. This is how it's playing it. And y'all sitting up here pawns. And Jake's is sitting up here 
the master manipulator, just putting his places where he wants to do it. And out of this whole deal, what turned into be, you know, a scandal, Jay said it there, turned it out to cause growth within his empire. All right. Here's a video of Torrey Roberts basically telling this church that um, that I'm going to become your part-time lover. <laughs> this is gangster too. He said that they're telling him, I'm going to be your part-time lover. I know you can't have me full-time. I just, I, I, let me, I just got this thought. Let me think. Husbands, go to your wife right now and tell her, Hey, baby, we got it going on good. But see, you know, Brenda down the street, she needs a little help. You know, she needs a little, little, she needs a little, 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 little attention. So I won't spend my first, you know, first couple of weeks here. And then I'm going to go two weeks down, down there and, uh, you know, help Brenda with her loneliness. How many of your wives would go for that? One LA church went for that. Went for that. This is the game. This is what they play. All right, revolution. The recently give to God. So I um this was in who have given a few, but this is this is a big one. So in February, you know, my, my father-in-law is Bishop T.D. Jakes. I believe he's one of the greatest men of God who ever walked the planet. And I honor him and celebrate him. And he's not just my, my, my father-in-law, but he is my spiritual dad. And he's my friend. And, and I just thank God for the way he's got my back and I got his. And in the context of having his back, you know, he, earlier this year, you know, the, Bishop Jakes has a church called the Potter's House. You ever heard of the Potter's House? Holler at me if you've heard the Potter's House. Okay. So he has the Potter's House Church, and there are three campuses in Dallas. The main campus is in, in Dallas, Texas, where he preaches from. And then he has two other campuses that kind of spun off from that. One is in Dallas, Fort Worth, and the other one is in North Dallas. He also has a campus in Denver, Colorado, and Denver, Colorado is, is the biggest of the uh, additional campuses, excluding the one that he oversee, that he pastors directly and speaks at for the most part in, da in, in Dallas. And so in about February, unfortunately, news broke out that the leader who was over that campus in Denver, Colorado, uh, had to be removed for uh, some some indiscretions, let's just put it that way, and that's it, that's his business, it's that had nothing to do with you, that's it. Okay, so indiscretion, this pastor had to be removed, and it left that church in turmoil. So now it happened at the most inopportune time because Bishop Jakes does this thing every year called the International Pastors and Leaders Conference where he brings, if you've been there, holler at me. Okay, it's an incredible thing. And it's not just for pastors, it's for business people, entrepreneurs, it is power, it's a life-changing experience. You gotta come with us next year if, if you've never been. But anyway, it happened at the most inopportune time. So he's got the International Pastors and Leadership Conference coming up in April, and he's got MegaFest, which draws 100,000 people from around the world, and it merges entrepreneurship and the kingdom and business and, and faith and entertainment, everything all in one, and it draws 100,000 people. And you can imagine, not only the budgetary expenses, but just the war who you have to become and what you have to do to manage all that stuff. And I was pissed, I'll be honest with you. Because here is my dad, he's getting ready to be 60 years old, he's worked hard, 40 years in ministry with no scandals. No scandals. Full of integrity, love, loving his wife, raising up spiritual sons, living in integrity, all this sort of stuff. And now he's got to deal with this, 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 this crisis that has blown up in Denver out of nowhere, that unexpected thing. And I'll be honest with you, as his spiritual son, as one who's always trying to protect him and preserve him, I was, I was pissed, I ticked. And, um, <laughs> and so, so he's got to fly to Denver to handle it, and I'm like, you know, Dad, I'm meeting you there. You know, when are you going? He's like, uh, you know, I'm going, I think, Thursday. And, and then he, he forgot to remind me he was going. So he called me Thursday, and he's like, I'm going. You're going to meet me there? I'm in L.A. Like, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, and so, so, you know, I get a ticket, and I fly, and I meet him 
in Denver, and I'm just there to support him. You know, I don't know what he's going to walk into. You know, he, you know, he oversees the campus, but he's not there a lot, you know. And so I went there basically like to be his armor bearer, you know, and he's got his security and armor bearer, but I, me too, me too, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so we go in there, and I'm just mad. I'm like, Dad, I'm sorry you got to go through this right now, and just tell me what I can do to help you to lighten the load or whatever. And so I go there, and we go into this meeting, and we're, we're at this meeting, and, and all of the leaders of the church are in this meeting. Right, and so I go in there. As a matter of fact, Charles is actually from Denver. He's one of the leaders from Denver, so he was there in that meeting. I didn't know him. So we're there in that meeting, and uh, and I'm sitting there, and it was strange. Like something started happening to me. First of all, when I walked into it's like this cafeteria space where they have this meeting. I walk in there, and like I could feel the weight. Like it was just heavy. I mean, you can imagine. Imagine losing your pastor to a scandal, right? And and he's gone, and and nothing is really, you know, that that would be tricky, wouldn't it? I hope you expect higher of me than that. That would be tricky, right? So I walk in there, and, and, and it's, you know, it's that environment. It's that atmosphere, and it was just, it, it was really thick. And I walk in there, and something started happening on the inside of me. So I'm there, like, for Bishop, you know, to, like, hold his arms up. But I leave out of that meeting with a burden for the people. Now, I'm like, oh, the devil is a liar. Uh-uh, no, 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 uh-uh. Because honestly, like, I care about a lot of people. I care about you guys. You guys number in about, you know, five or 6,000 people. You know, if you all came together at one time, we'd be in trouble. So I'm thinking to myself, I don't need to care about nobody else, you know, but I couldn't shake it. And so then I find myself like, like you know, so our, our strategy was to kind of just you know, to just bring in people to kind of, until we found the pastor or whatever, just to kind of bring in, you know, good people that we could, could minister to them and kind of hold them over or whatever. But I found myself on my phone, like logging into their service, saying, oh, don't, don't, don't say that, don't say, no, you need to say that, stop saying, don't, don't. you know, just like overseeing and critiquing all of the guest speakers that came in. And I'm like, Trey, dude, what are you doing? That's not your church, it's not your people, you know, you're busy, you ain't got time for this, come on. And so I kept fighting with that, right? You ever been fighting with something? It doesn't make sense to your mind, but your heart is connected, right? So, so this goes on and on, and then like God starts giving me vision for them, and like to really try to help them like bridge the gap, you know, because they're without a leader, several thousand member congregation, right? You know, and they're they're hurt and they're broken, and there's infighting, and it's just bad. It's just a mess, and so God starts giving me creativity, right? So I text. My father-in-law, I text Bishop, and I'm like, you know, hey, you know, God's given me, I got creativity for Denver, you know, and he doesn't hit me back. And I'm like, cool, cool, I don't, I didn't, I didn't really have it for, you know, you know how you get, you know what I mean, like when you, you put yourself out there, you know what I mean, and then, and then you're like, I didn't care anyway, I care, who I don't, I care here, you know, and so, so that was that, I let it go, kind of. But it was in my heart. And so uh, then, you know, uh, about maybe two months after that, this is right after First Lady got ordained, uh, I was sitting at the table with Bishop Jason and, and First Lady, and we were sitting at the table, and we were talking, and lunch was fine, you know, it was just a fi- everything's great. You know, she had just been ordained. We were cool, and we're sitting at the table, and, and, and Bishop says, things aren't looking so good down in Denver. And then he says, and he messed me up with this, He's like, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. And I'm sitting over there, and there are two versions of me inside of me. <laughs> One version of me is a little boy saying, I ain't saying nothing. I'm doing creativity for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And there's, you know, the little boy that gets wounded and plays tough like he doesn't care, but he really does care. But he's hiding behind this facade of not caring. So that little boy was in there. And then there was the, the, the person in there who had that creativity for Denver that was thinking like, man, if you, I, I can really, I can help. I'm telling you, I felt. And so this war is going on inside of me. And I'm sitting there, and I'm not saying anything, but there was just a fighting, a wrestling match on the inside of me while we're sitting at that table as I'm stuck with the words that have been left in the air. Things aren't going great in Denver. And I don't know what I'm going to do yet. And I sat there, and one is saying, fool, tell him you'll help. And the other one saying, nope, you did that already. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's this fight going on. And finally, I've learned not to listen to that little boy because he's stupid. <laughs> Hello, somebody. You got to be able to identify the hurt little boy or the hurt little girl on the inside of you 
from the spirit of God because that hurt little boy and that hurt little girl will sabotage everything that God is trying to bring you into. And so you got to identify it, discern the voice, and go with that whole version of you. you got to get wholeness. It's going to change your life. And so I step up and I say, hey, Dad, me and Sarah will hold down Denver for the month of July. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll hold it down. We got you. Really? You do that? Can you do that? I'm like, yeah, we'll divide and conquer. We'll figure it out. We can't let the church go down. You know what I mean? It's the people that are hurting. And we agreed. Fast forward to uh, Megafest this year was at the end, I believe it was the end of June. And I'm at Megafest. And have you ever had a message that is your entire life? Like, not like your life today, but like it's your life when you were a baby, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you were in college and up to now, it was one of those type of messages. I got 90% through this conference, through the Megafest, without being wrecked like that. And he messed around and preached this message that dealt with me about my one thing. It dealt with me about the boundaries of my yes. My family and I moved into a house that we love and we got everything, it was over time, we got all of our, our furniture. You know how like that, 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 there's that one piece of furniture that you wait for 12 weeks to get because it's so perfect? Like that one, that, that piece of furniture had literally got to my house that week. And then God starts messing with me. And here's what God says when he encountered me in Dallas at Megafest as it relates to that one thing, God said, if I told you to uproot yourself from LA and all that you have built and the church that you love and the state that you were born in and grew up in, you have mastered California. All your friends are here. All your connections are here. Everything is here. If I asked you to walk away from it all, and to go and pastor that church in Denver. Would you do it? Hey, family, I was wrecked. Because the truth of the matter is, you know what the answer was? No, 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 no. The answer was no. But I've walked with God long enough. And hear the story out, because some of you are getting sad already, and you don't have to be, trust me. It's true. I know my sheep. <laughs> Wait for it, okay? So I'm in there, and, God, and I'm crying. I'm at Megafest. There are thousands of people in the room. I didn't care because God, just like he was doing with the rich young ruler, he was looking at me. And he was seeing that in my heart, I was straight up saying, no, I'll go there for a month. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll go there for a month. But I know, no, Denver, I'm from L.A., baby. I like beaches. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I like sand. I like the hills where they got mountains. But I like, you know, that, this is who I am. It's L.A. I'm like Ty Dolla Sign. L.A., baby, this is, this is my place. This is my home. Right? L.A. made me. L.A. <laughs> made me. And yet, the reality of it is, God was saying to me, just like he said to the rich young ruler, yet one thing you lack. I raised you. L.A. didn't raise you. I raised you. I brought you up from a single parent home. I brought you up from Watts and South Central and Inglewood and protected you and kept you when you were shot when you were 16 years old. I am the one that sent the angel who's sitting right there to comfort you. <laughs> True story, he was on the job, LAPD. He was one of the first responders and comforted me and I believe that it had a lot to do with saving my life and now look, dressing all white like an angel like he was back then when I got shot. That, that was me, that was me. That was me. And God said, if I asked you to leave it all, that house you love, that you just got, uh -huh, and that piece of furniture that you waited 12 weeks for, 
If I asked you, if I needed you, you've needed me, and I've come through. If I've needed you because, if I needed you because there's a community in Denver that is suffering, while you're thriving, they're suffering. If I needed you to go, would you fight me because you're comfortable? This is your pastor. This is how I got here, family. I didn't got here being cute. I got here giving God hard yeses. And I cried. And I wept uncontrollably. And I was getting ready to, to get on a plane from Dallas and to fly into Denver because I could not say no. I could not say no. I know better. Sometimes I would rather God not ask me something. <laughs> because whatever you ask me, I gotta do. If you say shut LA down and go to the jungle with a sandwich and some bikini shorts <laughs> and a Bible, and I'll be with, I gotta go. I'm gonna make sure it's you. First, I need some confirmation, like a whole bunch. <laughs> but I got to go, right? And so, and so I said, oh God, and I cried and I wept. And what I was crying for was two things. One is it was mourning. See, you can say you'll do whatever you want to do, but until you're actually willing to do it, it doesn't matter. You know how the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted? Destiny will require you, watch this, willfully mourning something. There's some of you right now, and you need to mourn a relationship that should be dead, that you're trying to keep alive, right? You mourn when something is dying, and sometimes you got to put something on the altar and kill it and cry all you want to, but you are still killing that thing for destiny's sake. There's nothing more important to me than my destiny. And so in that moment, I acknowledge the call, and it is a call, to expand my leadership to cover the Denver campus of the Potter's House. I embraced that call because it was God. I've been in this long enough to know when God is speaking. And there were so many confirmations. I, wrote, I stopped writing. There were like 21 confirmations. I just stopped writing them down. God was front loading. And so then there was the question, okay, I know that I'm called to Denver. I get that. That's clear. I said, but what about L.A.? And God wouldn't speak to me. He wouldn't say anything to me because that wasn't immediately that was not my business because this is his church, right? This is his church. This is his church. You're not here because of me. You're here because God drew you to this place. The anointing is on this church. Okay. So I'm asking the question like, God, but I don't understand because although I, I, I'm called to Denver, you haven't called me away from 1LA. You follow what I'm saying? You, you, you called me to Denver, but you did not say leave LA. So I'm like, all right, you're going to have to make this plain. And in the process of time and praying and seeking and talking to my, my you know, of course, my wife and, and leaders of this church and, and, and my spiritual father, my covering and my accountability, uh, the head of that is Bishop T.D. Jakes, and there are a couple of other people, but Bishop is the one, right? A strategy came forth that would satisfy both of those questions. One was clear. You're called to Denver. What was not clear is how do you cover L.A.? And in talking... Here's what it is. For the most part, 1LA has been a lone wolf. And to be honest with you, I have liked that. I, 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 I like that. You can start it. I, I like the independence of it. I like the freedom of it. I like the uniqueness of it. I like the autonomy of it. God is doing a new thing. He's done a new thing with 1LA. I like the power of it. I like the, the freshness of it. I like the diversity of it, right? I, I love that it's not religious and stiff and all those sort of things. But there are limitations when you're out there by yourself. Then I marry Sarah. And Sarah is incredible. And she's anointed. And she's a gift. And she's awesome. 
and she has been trained and cultivated. Basically, not only are we a blended family, but we are a blended ministry. Are you tracking with me? And so for the past at least two years, we have been talking and trying to figure out, we know that there's synergy between the, the two movements. There's synergy, there's legacy, and, and we've been talking about, you know, how do we bring all of this together? As you've known, we've been involved in all of the events in Dallas, Mega Fest, international pastors and leaders. And so there's been this synergy ongoing for the past couple of years. Bishop has been there to speech, and I've been preaching there. She's been preaching there. And so what emerged from that synergy is a new glorified movement called the Potter's House at 1LA. 